Some reactions, they take energy to make happen. Some reactions release energy when they happen. For example, when we melt ice to make water, um, that's not a chemical reaction, but it still requires a lot of energy. Now, for chemical reactions that require energy, as opposed to physical processes, what can we th perhaps think of? Hmm. Well, why is it that photosynthesis requires sunlight? So, incoming energy. Well, because, energetically speaking, the resulting sugar, or any intermediates pretty much, have higher energy than what you started with. Whereas we know that sugar can be oxidized to release energy, cellular respiration. So what do these processes all require? Well, wait a second, guys. We know that at gas stations, there are no smoking signs. Yet, the combustion of gasoline is controllable. It doesn't spontaneously self-ignite just uh, at ambient room temperatures. But if we provide a little bit of activation energy, well, I mean, a little bit by macro scale, so say a spark, then the reaction ends up propagating because, oh, hey, first gasoline molecule to combust releases energy. Other gasoline molecules become activated and they combust, so they react with oxygen and they release more energy and boom. Now, some reactions go fast and are spontaneous. Some reactions are spontaneous, so energetically they're favorable, like gasoline combusting, but they're slow. So, say you leave sugar out on a table and you wait for it to oxidize. Well, I wouldn't recommend this because it takes a while. Even, say, something as volatile as nitroglycerin, which is the reason they invented dynamite, so bind the nitroglycerin in diatomaceous earth to make it less susceptible to shocks and just exploding whenever it's like you shake it, for example. Although, I wouldn't recommend shaking dynamite either because, well, if you store dynamite for a while, uh, it tends to sweat the nitroglycerin out and that crystallizes on the paper wrappers that dynamite blocks generally come in, and that's even more susceptible to shock and friction than uh, just liquid nitroglycerin. So, that's why they invented better explosives later on that weren't quite so uh, potentially dangerous to handle. Okay, so how can we uh, make these processes like, oh, let's watch this sugar on a table uh, get oxidized. How can we make it occur at a biologically relevant rate so that I, for example, can talk to you or talk at you because there's no dialogue here? Well, we use enzymes. Catalysts lower the activation energy of a reaction. So, so suppose we draw ourselves a diagram and this is energy level and this is time passing. A reaction can look like this. So yeah, energetically speaking, it's favorable. It is spontaneous. Energy gets released. Great. Um, guys, if we're just going to mix a little bit of oxygen and a little bit of hydrogen together, we can sit there and watch this sample for basically an indeterminate amount of time at room temperature and it's very unlikely to actually have enough go over the peak due to the way uh, the kinetic molecular theory of matter works. The energy distribution of molecules at a given temperature, they just don't crash into each other hard enough, usually. Now, okay, a few exceptions will, in theory, make it over, but, well. The point is that we don't see that sample going pop and spontaneously turning into water vapor. Well, warm water vapor, because energy gets released. So, uh, how can we make this go faster? 
okay let's use an enzyme to bind this and make this activation energy here really really small this will make it so that a process that in some cases has half-lives of stuff like millions of years or even billions of years happen in milliseconds so enzymes are incredibly efficient at what they do for the most part why for the most part well um guys uh, we know that in nature we have monomolecular reactions which are decomposition so bam it breaks apart we have dimolecular so they ram into each other in a certain orientation okay we can lock them into an enzyme and pin them into place so that yeah they're still shaking around with the same temperature um, but really the only thing they can knock into e is each other and they will eventually knock into each other the right way for the reaction to happen what if we add more molecules or what if these molecules have several wiggly parts and they need to all ram into each other in the right way well then it can be the case that the enzyme uh, has a reaction rate that's rather slower than many many millions of times per second okay so what does an enzyme use? I mean, we know we have reactants and products in a chemical equation. Uh, for enzymes, we call them substrates and products. So substrates are recognized by and bind to an enzyme. Now, enzymes can technically catalyze the reaction both ways. How can we tell that? Wait a second, let's take a look at our diagram again. So suppose we manage to put in enough energy that some of the product gets forced back over the hump. Hey guys, is it easier to force it all the way back over a tall hump or over a much smaller one? Obviously the smaller one is easier, right? So, enzymes and substrates. The induced fit hypothesis says that when you bind the substrate to the active site, the enzyme will undergo a conformational change so that it better binds the substrate. Now what happens after the reaction has occurred? Well, the products may induce another change in the enzyme so that it's not as good at binding product. However, this is not necessarily the case. Hence why it's possible for enzymes to catalyze the reverse reaction as well. Of course, generally, uh, the enzyme will have much better affinity for the substrate than it does for the product due to various conformational changes. Okay, so in the catalytic cycle we have this happening. First the substrate binds. In this case the enzyme is beta-galactosidase. This forms an enzyme substrate complex. This is sometimes written as ES. And you can probably guess what S is. This is concentration of substrate. So sometimes you see concentration of substrate and concentration of enzyme substrate complex, concentration of product, concentration of enzyme product complex, and then there's inhibitors and activators. So that's stuff you'll see a little bit later on. For now, we are learning the more qualitative side instead of the quantitative, oh, uh, this is michaelis menten equation. This is how enzyme kinetics work. That comes a little later. So the hydrolysis reaction here is catalyzed. It takes much less energy than it otherwise would because, hey, um, suppose I have a paper clip and I leave it sitting there and I wa try to watch for it to spontaneously uh, break in half. I'll be watching for a very long time. On the other hand, suppose I get something that grabs both ends of the paper clip and I pull it apart and then flex it back together a few times. That doesn't quite apply here. Here we just 
pull it apart enough, put enough strain on it, and then we shove the water in pretty much, and then it breaks apart. The point is that if you have something that exerts tension on it just by its natural chemical properties after grappling onto both ends of the paper clip, your paper clip will break, after you flex a few times, pretty fast compared to, okay, I'm just going to leave it here and I'm going to watch uh, until it spontaneously snaps in half. Good luck on the waiting. Okay, so. What happens after the reaction is complete? Well, generally the binding coefficient for products is lower. There are cases though where the binding coefficient for the products is actually very, very high. And the reason why you consume ATP for such a reaction, so why you consume energy in the reaction, is actually to pry the products off of the enzyme. Because if you phosphorylate the enzyme somewhere, hey guys, let's shove a nice big negative charge up this side of the enzyme and guess what happens to the nearby ionic groups? Obviously, they're going to move in response, right? And then the overall enzyme structure shifts somewhat and pop, those products end up popping off. Uh, of course, there is also a dissociation constant issue here, but that's for a biochemistry class, pretty much. So, now the enzyme can catalyze another reaction. So the active site is now clear. Now what happens when the enzyme happens to need something else to work? So something that's not a protein? Well, we have a cofactor. Many vitamins are cofactors or coenzymes, such as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, which is derived from niacin, or vitamin B3. There are plenty of others that are very much uh, commonly mentioned in biology class, when it comes to the biochemistry units, or in biochemistry class period, such as coenzyme A. Acetyl-CoA is something you'll be dealing with a lot when it comes to mitochondria, for example. And then there's stuff like FADH and so on. So, coenzymes, organic molecule that acts as a cofactor. A cofactor is defined as a non-protein group, right? So wait a second, um, hey, why are we even treating these as two separate terms? Well, it's because some enzymes come in multiple parts and, well, yeah, okay, cofactors, non-protein groups, coenzymes, they act as a cofactor, but they don't necessarily have to be non-proteins. Okay. Now, what happens when we add more enzyme? Well, each subunit of enzyme is capable of, of catalyzing so, however many reactions, approximately, per second. Okay, um, this assumes that there is a great excess of substrate. Why? Oh, hey guys, um, we only have enough substrate to measure, oh, uh, one second of activity from one mole of the enzyme. First of all, you aren't going to be dealing in moles of enzyme. Why? Okay, how big is an enzyme? Well, okay, often it's something like, say, oh, uh, 53,000 atomic mass units. Um, guys, one mole for something that's one atomic mass unit is one gram. So I don't think you're dealing with 53 kilograms of protein. Um, okay, so let's say, oh, we only have enough substrate in this mixture for one millimole for one second. What happens when we add more than that? Okay, obviously we're not going to see this rate of reaction just keep on being linear, right? So this needs to be a great excess of substrate. Okay, so why did I use 53,000 for the example just now? It's because of P53, a very famous protein. So, what happens uh, when we have a certain amount of enzyme and just add more and more substrate? Well, initially, when there's a lot of enzyme left over that's not doing anything, more substrate equals pretty much linear increase 
in, well, reaction rate. But once we get close to, oh, all the enzyme is being in use all the time, uh, we end up with this happening. Saturation level occurs. So if we increase substrate concentration, sooner or later, we're going to run out of enzyme to use. So it ends up saturating, topping out. Now what happens when we decide that, hey, we need to be able to turn these enzymes off? Or turn them on for that matter. Well, we have regulators such as enzyme inhibitors. Competitive inhibition is where, hey, instead of letting the substrate bind here, we just shove something else that kind of looks like the substrate, well, on a molecular scale at least, in there and block the enzyme activity by competing for the active site. That's why it's called competitive inhibition. Now for non-competitive, sometimes spelled with a dash, uh, we have binding that's somewhere else. So, hey, let's shove, say, a phosphate group in the enzyme somewhere. And guess what happens? Well, more like usually attach it onto the enzyme because that's what phosphorylation does. So what happens? Well, okay, uh, some of the functional groups end up moving aside or others end up getting repelled or maybe attracted. And in the end, the enzyme shape changes and the substrate cannot bind as effectively. Now, non-competitive inhibition may be reversible or irreversible. There's also a category called uncompetitive inhibition, but that's for another time. Okay, some enzymes have an off switch. Others, well, they can have an on switch instead. An allosteric site can be for an inhibitor or an activator. Allosteric regulation is a matter of other place. We know that sympatric speciation is same country or same region speciation. So in the same environment, we get speciation. Allopatric, which is usually more studied and common. Well, allopatric is say, oh, uh, a population of butterflies end up getting divided into two separate valleys. And due to low gene flow between them, Eventually, they accumulate differences and they cannot interbreed anymore. That's allopatric. So, other country. Well, what does allosteric imply? Steric hindrance in chemistry is pretty much, hey guys, we have this big group sticking out here and we're trying to conduct the just reaction here, right next to it. Yeah, no, that's not going to fit. So, allosteric is different site on molecule. So, we can have it be an inhibitor or an activator. It can potentially be uh, reversible or irreversible, depending on what you're dealing with. And we know that, in general, our bodies are pretty good at conserving resources. So, suppose we have enough of a particular amino acid our body will stop making that type of amino acid, or at least greatly slow down the rate of making that amino acid. That is negative feedback. Or we can say that it is feedback inhibition in terms of regulating this pathway. So the final product is an inhibitor for usually the first enzyme in the chain. Why usually? Why not always? Um, hey guys, maybe there's a branch here that goes somewhere else. Well, hey, what if we still need that other amino acid that we can make from this first intermediate? That would be bad, right? If we stopped making this first intermediate, but we still needed the other product? Yeah, okay. So, uh, there are positive feedback loops in the human body, such as childbirth but they are pretty rare. Generally, the body tries to maintain a relatively constant state. Now, pH and temperature effects on enzymes. Okay, guys, we know that if we boil an egg, 
uh, it doesn't look like the usual globular proteins you deal with anymore, at least the egg white. The egg yolk, that's a completely different matter. So, the globular proteins that we usually deal with are water soluble. We know that we can dilute egg white. We can't do this with boiled egg white because it has denatured. Now, like other proteins, enzymes will denature at high enough temperatures. Now, various enzymes have different activity curves depending on temperature. Uh, different organisms will have different activity curves for what are labeled the same enzyme. Why? Well, okay, either you add additional prosthetic groups, so cofactors, or you can have amino acid sequence differences. Because I think we can all figure out that, yeah, okay, they might have the same name, they might have the same function, but the amino acids we're going to use for that enzyme in a polar dwelling bacterium versus a hot springs dwelling bacterium are going to be uh, different. Because, well, the polar dweller wants it to be as active as it can get at lower temperatures, even though it'll be less active than the equivalent at higher temperatures, unless the one at higher temperatures is specialized to survive instead of specialized to go as fast as it can under said conditions. They are competing interests. Why? Well, actually, even at relatively modest temperatures, we also have these issues of competing interest. Darker maned lion males, like lion males, you know, they have that huge mane. Um, the ones with darker fur are generally healthier and stronger. 